کے نوٹ اسپیکر از ڈاکٹر جوائن رول ڈین اسکول آف بزنس ایٹ میڈگر ایور کالج دا سٹی یونیورسٹی آف نیو یارک یو ایس اے شی ہیز مور دین تھری ڈیکرس آف ایکسپیرینس ان ہائر ایجوکیشن کارپوریٹ اینڈ گورنمنٹ آپریشنس میں آئی ناؤ ریکویسٹ ڈاکٹر جوائن رول ٹو کم اینڈ ڈیلیور ہر کی نوٹ اسپیکر مور تھاک دیٹ آئی ہیو فار یو دس مارننگ از ٹائٹل فرام گڈ ٹو گریٹ شیک بیمنگ اے فلیٹ گلوبل اکانمی In this brief time I have with you, I'm going to try to do three things. I'm going to share a little bit about who I am and the institution I serve, share a little about the School of Business and our mission in the U.S., and share about our outcomes in entrepreneurship. That's one of the focus areas that I've had. In the School of Business at Megger Everest College, we are on a journey of a path from the good historical achievements of our past to the great task of positive change in the lives. And notice I didn't say lives at Megger Ellis College, I said lives with a big L. February of 2018, we held our very first retreat sponsored by our stakeholders, our alumni and a corporate sponsor. The following clip I'm going to have played for you, it's a video clip, is to share with you some of the sentiment of our alumni, our faculty, our staff, and our senior administrators who could not be here with you. If we focus and we listen to industry and we prepare our students for the industry needs, that we will be able to place them, and by placing them and focusing on the outcomes and the output, our input will be greater taught me I sat at the door 30 minutes before exam just with a quick review and, and I usually tease them all you know what you're gonna give me that I can't come to I would ask you as we start thinking about how we grow from good to great together and how all of us find our own internal sounds and work across systems across disciplines that we think about the final product He said, no, no, young man, you, you just need to understand. This is about hard work in business, knowing how to make deals in business, knowing how to create your own business, knowing how to create your own wealth, and understanding the dynamic of business in the world. Not in Chicago, not in New Jersey, not in New York, but in the world. And it was that sense of global business that really excited me. That you're doing to feed that growth. But it's got to be intentional, and it's got to be something that you're doing every day. Now, when I teach it, I talk about being able to capture what it is that you focused on that day. When you string those days together, spend at least an hour at the end of the week seeing what was the trend. What is my focus? What does it look like I'm working on? What are the results that I'm getting? So that you, you're being intentional about measuring your growth. Now, in closing, I'm going to share this with those of you who I would call our seasoned leaders. And it says, at the end of life, what really matters is not what we bought, but what we built. Not what we got, but what we shared. Not our competence, but our character. And not our success, but our significance. And to our younger leaders, those who are just stepping out and putting your foot in the water, I would share this with, with you. Don't give up what you want most for what you want now. In the journey from good to great, You don't simply go from good to great. You grow from good to great. But the question for me at Medgar is, in this now smallish world, how do we project our students as the ray of light into the business and financial community and the PA community and the governmental community? How do we project our young people out there so that they are the ones that will actually set the world on fire in terms of the way that people make money, share money, and build wealth within communities. And more important than that to me, now this is just my own bias, is how do we then create for young people a moral center around that which they make that money? That the fact that you may have money does not mean necessarily that you get to keep all your money. 
that there is such a thing as giving. Amen. That there is such a thing as giving back. That you paved the road for other people to be able to do what you did. That somebody opened the door for you, therefore you are obligated morally to open the door for someone else. This is what I, our college will ultimately begin to do. I thank you, Dean, and all of your colleagues and friends and people who have been here all day as faculty and staff and students. I thank you because I do know you can't do this work without bumping into these concepts one way or the other. My only hope is that you all get an opportunity to see to fruition that which you are willing so desperately and earnestly to create. Thank you so much. So you saw him in the clip. He was the last speaker in the video. I bring you greetings from our president, Dr. Rudolph Krug, our provost, Dr. Augustine Okariki, and a host of Mega Everest College City University of New York. That would be CUNY, staff, faculty, and students. We at Medgar Evers College owe our gratitude to you for your kind invitation to us today and congratulate you on organizing this inaugural international business conference. I'll take just a few more minutes of your time to talk about the charge for new leaders to shape a flattened economy into a river of opportunity for all across the globe in the future. Why we shape our future? Because the current trajectory from socioeconomic ills such as unemployment, underemployment, poverty, and despair globally is not sustainable. While delivering a speech last year at the UN Committee on the Status of Women uh, meeting that I, uh, I was at and uh, delivering the speech, we were told that the income inequity is worsening. Eight men own half of the wealth in the world and there is no indication that that trend will improve. The New York Times International Edition published an article called The Future of Not Working. That was in February 24, uh, February 24th, 2017. The day, that day, a team of Mega Everest College students and faculties were leaving Nairobi, Kenya. In summary, the article reinforced the concept that automation and high productivity of new systems may reduce the global demand for labor in the future and alternative income sources for the poor may be needed. The article went on to describe a proof of concept testing universal income currently piloted in one of Kenya's poorest villages. Why Kenya? Paradoxically, Kenya is a leading contributor to the fintech revolution in mobile application, innovation, and development. Yet Nairobi, where many multinational corporations are based, is home to some of the world's largest slums. Rural villagers migrated from farms hoping for an improved quality of urban life. What many often find is a lack of capacity for the local economy to absorb the increased labor in the market, and many have few options for survival. I will share with you more about Kenya later as I discuss our work in entrepreneurship if I have a, a, a little extra time. So colleagues, we cannot accept the future as it is written. We must find ways to rethink, re-engineer, reshape a future that will be sustainable for all. So who is this woman <clears throat> before you demanding change for the future? I always speak of my great grandmother from Cat Island, Bahamas, that's where we hail from, because that is our material rock. She was a serial entrepreneur who could not read or write. Later in life, she was blind, yet she had vision. I always speak of my own journey of being the first in my family to earn a college degree, and now all of my siblings, and even half dozen, have college degrees, and four out of the six have advanced degrees. My family was honored last year at the University of Miami for producing the largest number of graduates from a single family and the history of that university. So I, I, I am, I'm used to being first. So who, who, who am I? I'm a black woman who is old enough to have lived in segregation and witnessed the change to integration. I remember living in a black town in Richmond Heights, that's in Miami, Florida, Southern Florida, with black businesses, black doctors, black churches, and being enveloped by other black communities. I remember seeing my first white man, I was of elementary school age, for the first time, and uh, my mother was rushing me to the back of the house as if I would be looking at death. 
It felt like a death blow when they told us we would be the first class to integrate a white high school in Miami, Florida. It was at that high school that I was told that I was poor. And I did not understand what that meant because in our neighborhood, we owned our own homes, we owned our own cars, and we were taken care of by the community. That began my search and my love of the discipline of economics. It was in that high school that I had my first economics class, and I tried to discern and better understand the difference between race and class. I later was accepted to the University of Miami on study management because no one told me a black person in America could be an economist. Seeing is believing. The university hired his first black faculty member in the School of Business, and he was an economist. I took every economics course I could and later went on to study economics at the graduate level. When I entered my PhD program at Howard University, that's in Washington, D.C., there were only seven black women in America who held the degree. None of my faculty were women. It took me 10 years to finish the degree, and it wasn't the coursework. I was able to do the coursework and the testing. I learned how to do that in 18 to 24 months. What was really tough for me was the research. The research on urban housing markets and, and racial submarkets was difficult, but I did finish. My PhD degree is now over three decades old. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a true believer that education changes lives. But in this dynamic, ever-changing world, as you just heard before, what kind of education is important? The leaders that we are preparing must be more dynamic, more agile, more capable of bending change for those who cannot. That is what has led me and others to study the development of entrepreneurship. Those who bend the factors of production shaping and changing worldwide demand for resources, those who are creators of engagement, those who can shape a flat world to serve and yield more to all. So who is at Mega Evans College of Business and what have they done? I have a brief PowerPoint, but I really, uh, in respect of the time, will only show you that if I have time at the end. But I want to use my final minutes to share with you uh, a, a little bit more of what we believe at uh, Mega Evers, what the students need. The students we are preparing must be creative, resourceful, intuitive. They must understand that innovation is a necessity because business as usual is a death sentence in our dynamic global economy that we live in. We must have vision. We must believe in the transformation. We must build and develop teams. But most of all, we must <coughs> believe in our passion to make the journey. We must set a mission that is shaped and guided by our collective vision. It should be clear and powered by our very souls. Because we will have many challenges and obstacles in our path. But if our vision and our souls are aligned, when we fall, we will rise. We must get past the launch mindset. You know, a lot of businesses launch every year globally. We are here. We are on a path to growth. We must find ways and strategies to nourish and sustain our growth and the growth of the future <coughs> leaders we serve. We must find ways to mentor them, expand their networks, help them feed their souls, and help them feed their passions. The world of global business is different. Diversity of cultures, diversity of skills, diversity of disciplines, and diversity of needs. We must find ways to surround ourselves with difference so we understand the different prisms of opportunity. How can we develop solutions to problems that we don't know exist? We must be driven and obsessed by the experience of our young leaders. I remember that one year ago I considered canceling a trip to a conference. Then one of the students in a candid conversation said the conference she attended before changed her life. So tell me, colleagues, how do you calculate the return on investment of a changed life? You don't. You just do it. So in our growth mindset, I encourage you to shed the cloak of usual and normalcy. We must become extraordinary storytellers, delivering our message of excellence on demand, live, digital, and in print. We must have a broad global footprint that shares our story facilitated by digital and other media. We must become fearless voyagers, seeking adventures of the unknown and difference. 
We must channel our passion to strategies that create, innovate, and disrupt the status quo. We must be willing to fail as most entrepreneurs fail before they succeed. We must be willing to learn. As we learn, we continue to grow and improve our ability to sustain and adapt to change. We must be willing to be comfortable with ambi ambiguity. Oh, that's a lot more than I need. <laughs> and, and uncertainty, for there will be, uh, we will find opportunity. Finally, we must be willing to change, for in change, we will reshape a future that has never existed. So in the shadows of history, we, must co we come humbly before you, our institution bearing the name of a heroic leader who helped transform the destiny of many lives. Many of you may have heard of Megar Evans the man. He was a civil rights and social justice advocate willing to fight for change. He, he was a believer in the power of a vision for justice. He is quoted as saying, you can kill a man, but you can't kill an idea. Megar Evans the man was shot down and killed, but his vision of change and social justice lives on at Megar Evers College. The next generation will experience a new revolution based on artificial intelligence, nanoscience, nanotechnology, etc. That will fundamentally change work as we know it today. Many traditional jobs will be replaced by new a new generation of robots and highly sophisticated computers. The multinational corporations of the world don't have enough capacity, and I say they also don't have enough desire, to hire all the students of the world that colleges and universities are producing. We must become our own job creators, job innovators, and entrepreneurial disruptors in a world that is not colorblind. Like Megar Evers, we must be willing to stand tall in our conviction that change must come or the next generation will perish in a growing class of poverty and despair. Education was once the great equalizer. Now you will find a growing educated underclass with limited opportunities. This is not a one college, one country, a one race peril. It is a global crisis faced in Latin America, Africa, Asia, yes, and in North America. So as you think about the return on your investment, the opportunity cost for you being here, your time spent here today, remember we must reinvent and transform our future, then channel the passion in our collective souls to grow and sustain the better and brighter world we live in. But if you really want to leverage that ROI, if you want to change the world, stand with us a growing number of dedicated men and women who believe in the vision of global, global entrepreneurial thinking, creators of opportunity, creators of change, change that transform destinies of generations to come. So my friends, I have shared with you that I have lived in a place and a time when men and women were separated by race, gender, and class to a time and a space that all men and women must work together for the survival of our united future, and I say the future of our children. I close with a quote from the great visionary leader, Nelson Mandela. Do not judge me by my successes. Judge me by how many times I fell down and got back up again. We may fall, my friends, but together we will rise and reshape this flat world of ours today for a better world for tomorrow. God bless you. I don't have time for the slides. <laughs>